Hi there, friend. My name is John Verner. I used to be a part of the largest cult in the United States. After studying the Bible, Christian history, and ministry, I set my sights on confronting the problematic nature of white evangelicalism in the United States. In 2019, I published my first book as a first step in addressing the subtle issues of this complex system. This podcast will continue that work under the same title. Welcome to The Cult of Christianity. A sermon is an oration or lecture by a preacher who is usually a member of clergy. Sermons address a scriptural, theological, or moral topic, usually expounding on a type of belief, law, or behavior within both past and present context. In short, sermons are boring TED Talks. There are arguments about when the tradition of preaching first started. Evangelicals and most uh, Orthodox Christians trace preaching back to Christ and the apostles, maybe even daring to venture that sermons were present in the Old Testament era. The most famous sermon in scripture is undoubtedly Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. But I often question if you could call this account a sermon in any formal sense. The account of Jesus talking is likely a reliable historical account of Jesus talking, but I understand sermons as more than simply talking. I am hoping that I am not giving a sermon by talking on this podcast, though the phrase, don't preach at me, might be uttered by my detractors. I would be even more disappointed if while I was walking in a group and talking about my perspective on life, it was perceived as a homily. I wonder if this is what happened with Jesus. We know he did not ask for a crowd to gather and listen to this particular message. Crowds were following him, and he sat down on a mountainside with his posse of 12 disciples, his looser clique of 70-ish disciples, and likely at least a hundred more gathered. And he spoke about radically necessary changes in the religious culture that needed to happen. The Gospel of Matthew places this event as early on in Jesus' ministry, and a culmination of Jesus being followed, Forrest Gump style, all about Galilee. This was likely not the first time that Jesus had said some of this content, but this might have been the first time he bothered to climb up a mountain so that his voice would carry better. This information, I suppose, makes this event a sermon of sorts. But the informal nature of this homily is worth noting. Jesus did not consider himself a preacher, I don't think. He seems to view himself as a messenger, or perhaps even a prophet, but not as a person who wants their full-time job to be giving lectures to crowds. I doubt the apostles viewed their sermons later on as their primary function as human beings either. In fact, the Greek idea of preaching means to proclaim a much more general concept than a preacher behind a pulpit. A better understanding of these speeches might be some sort of picture of an ancient political rally. These ideologies being touted were significantly countercultural and not used to solidify a hierarchical order within a particular group, but to inspire hearts and heads to change life direction. These sermons were orations of revolutions. It is not until a good bit after the Bible was assembled in the 5th century that sermons became more regular liturgical practices within Orthodox Christianity. So, how did sermons become such an essential part of evangelical culture? Well, the short answer to that question, it turns out, that lecturing on a scriptural, theological, or moral topic is an effective device in centralizing communities around a big idea. Even so, preaching is still a broad enough subject that there are different kinds of preachers. Teacher preachers believe that their hearers should understand, contemplate, and further study scripture. Such preachers read explicit text and explain its meaning deductively. Typically, in dogmatic and educational tone, the teacher preacher examines verses in logical order. Some examples of teacher preachers are John Stott, John Ortberg, Tim Keller, 
Jack Hayford and John MacArthur. Often Brainian style, teacher preachers want to get information across. Herald preachers, on the other hand, are quite different. They emphasize God's empowering of both scripture and the actual preaching event of that moment. Though such preaching shares deductive and propositional characteristics in common with teaching preaching, its tone is less comparable. Herald preachers are often dramatic in style. While teacher preachers could be considered left brain, referring to small details and building their sermons with many bricks, so to speak, herald preachers are right brain using large building blocks. Often herald preachers are fiery and bold about their opinions and demand a committed response from their listeners. Examples of uh, herald preachers include Billy Graham, Gardner Taylor, Jeremiah Wright, Robert Smith Jr., the reformer Martin Luther, and Karl Barth. Inductive preachers, the category I most likely fell into back in my day, view the hearer's needs as most important, and that preaching must be relevant to them. In marked contrast with the deductive preaching of teachers and heralds, this style has people as its focus, and only goes back to scripture to find appropriate text. Such inductive preaching may be evangelistic, defensive, pastoral, or political. And examples of inductive preachers include Bob Russell, John Maxwell, Brian McLaurin, Rick Warren, uh, Bill Hybels, and Rob Bell. Narrative preachers, the best preachers, if you ask me, believe that a story is the way listeners have an experience of divine truth. Though most preachers use stories, this specific kind of preaching pays particular attention to hear his listening patterns and plan their sermons accordingly. With its root in scriptural narratives, uh, specifically Jesus' parables, it has gained the most popularity over the last hundred years out of these four examples. And notable examples of narrative preachers are Calvin Miller, uh, Max Luce- Lucado, I always mispronounce his name, Lee Strobel, Barbara Brown Taylor, and Eugene Lowry. Looking back at the New uh, the New Testament, all sermons by Christ and others were likely heralding sermons. They were given to signi- signify a dramatic change that was happening in history. These sermons were often context-specific and full of encouragement to follow in Christ's footsteps and not to give in to the mere politics of the time. Additionally, Christ's sermons were given to masses of Jews and often included admonishments to the religious leaders of the day, and their ways of thinking. Jesus liked to flip common phrases on their head and introduce inclusive ideas such as loving your enemy, turning the other cheek, and getting along with Gentiles. While these early Christian speeches would sometimes invoke the end of days or warn of judgment, they were more concerned with the current, for them current, societal landscape. They were certainly persuasive, and encouraged allegiance to, quote, the way, end quote, but they were for anyone who would hear them. These sermons used common logic and language. The point of these sermons was often to solidify principles Jesus had put forth. So let's fast forward through over a thousand years of church history. The first and second Great Awakening were the largest catalysts for the widespread, emphatic, and regulated preaching in Protestantism, which was an amalgamation of combining all four kinds of preaching I mentioned earlier. The most essential figure of the First Great Awakening was Jonathan Edwards. Most cons- uh, historians could cons- consider Jonathan Edwards um, the Northampton Anglican minister, one of the chief fathers of the Great Awakening. Edwards' uh, messages centered on the idea that humans were sinners, God was an angry judge, and that individuals needed to ask for forgiveness. He also preached justification by faith alone, not through good deeds. In 1741, Edwards gave a infamous and emotional sermon titled, quote, Sins in the, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, end quote. News of the message spread quickly throughout the colonies. Here is a quote from that sermon. Quote, the bow of God's wrath is bent, 
and the arrow made re- ready on the string. And justice bends the arrow at your heart and strains the bow. And it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God and that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow one moment from being made drunk with your blood. End quote. This is an example of the tone of this sermon. The visceral, fear-inducing, and violent language was impressively and somewhat artistically weaved through every sentence of this sermon. Many congregants are reported to have had audible and physical reactions to these kinds of messages from Edwards and others. This type of preaching was cathartic and entertaining. Thousands were converted to Christianity in the mid-1700s directly caused by this fire and brimstone type of preaching. Theologically, this shift in Christianity was a result of the antagonistic feelings towards Quakerism that the leaders of Christians felt at the time. The principles that were solidified as Orthodox Christianity in this era were that, one, sin without salvation will send a person to hell. Two, all people can be saved if they confess their sins to God, seek forgiveness, and accept God's grace. Three, all people can have a direct and emotional connection with God. And four, religion shouldn't be as formal and institutionalized as Catholicism, but rather casual and personal. There are some famous preachers in recent years that I must mention in order to understand or help the listener understand what the current scenery of white evangelicalism is in the United States, at least as far as preaching is concerned. Top of every list, I must mention Billy Graham, the most influential preacher of all time, perhaps, and he deserves his own episode to deconstruct. His founding of Christianity Today magazine and his various conferences centralized evangelical thought and news from around the world, and he is responsible for much of the language white evangelicals still use today. Next on my list is Rick Warren, who is considered a model and guru for today's new generation of preachers and church planners uh, who seek to create churches that will reach the unchurched of their own generation. Founder of Saddleback Church in Orange County, California, now one of the largest churches in America, he is widely known as the author of The Purpose Driven Church, as well as one of the all-time bestsellers, The Purpose Driven Life. Warren's most significant influence on today's pastors might be through his uh, creative use of the internet, including his weekly newsletter that reaches more pastors than any other mass email. His own sermons, made available online, have become models for many young pastors in the United States and around the world. John MacArthur, pastor of Grace Community Church in Sunny Valley, California. Side note, notice how many of these pastors are California-based. Almost as if Christianity has taken some cues from Hollywood. Anyways, MacArthur is a teacher on the Grace to You program and has used radio as a medium more effectively than many. Centering much of his message on controversial topics, MacArthur has engaged in a variety of theological debates through the years via his speaking and writing. As he has gotten older, he has continued to double down on bigoted views under the guise of being a traditionalist. I don't like him, and I'm not sorry. Someone I do still somewhat respect is uh, Haddon Robinson, who has used the classroom and printed page to exert a profound influence on the American pulpit during the past 25 years. His uh, book, Biblical Preaching, is still the most widely used preaching textbook, um, helping to prepare thousands of young preachers to develop big idea sermons, the type of sermon I'm actually trained in. He was a professor of preaching at three prominent evangelical seminaries. Robinson further influenced many of those who now teach preaching in colleges and seminaries, including my preaching prof. Michael Milton wrote about Haddon that he was arguably the greatest preacher in North America. Dr. Robinson has influenced pulpits all over America and through his ministry at Gordon-Conwell and Denver Seminary. Before that, may Dr. Robinson rest in peace. John Piper has been a powerful influence on young pastors through his writing and speaking as well. His passionate style and ability to navigate controversy in seemingly unthreatening ways has made him a well-respected figure across denominations, even though he's still afraid to go, still unafraid rather, to go against uh, the status quo. 
He has been a keynote speaker at the Trendy Christian Mecca, the Passion Conference, for many years, and both his in presence and uh, in position, he sort of reminds me of the Bernie Sanders of evangelicalism. But what is an evangelical Bernie without an evangelical Trump? Not only did Mark Driscoll pastor Mars Hill as it grew from zero to mega church in America's most unchurched city in less than a decade, but he has also launched a national network of church planners that is infecting cities across the country. Reformed, angry, and controversial, Driscoll, before being somewhat canceled for abusing his congregation, was a role model for thousands of young pastors who read his books and listened faithfully to his podcast sermons. He is a bully, abuser, heretic, and prime example of how Christianity has turned into a cult. Now, there are others who would be worth mentioning if time permitted. All these preachers have appealing traits, and in my opinion, repulsive traits. Rather than dig up dirt on each of them, I want to point out the glaringly obvious fact that all the people I just mentioned are white men. While there have been influential pastors who were not white and not men, not least of which is the famous uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, it might actually be counterproductive to mention black pastors or women pastors in this context. Their influence has not penetrated white evangelical cults, and even further, there is a deeply ingrained belief in traditional conservative evangelicalism that women should not be pastors. That would be a sin to allow anyone other than cisgender men to preach. In fact, when I went to Bible college, there were only two women in my major's graduating class, and while they had the support of our preaching prof and a few more progressively minded male peers, they were undoubtedly not offered the same support and conditions that I was. I actually recently caught up with one of these lovely ladies and got to interview them about their perspective and experience when it comes to sexism in preaching. And you stay tuned to hear that interview right after this ad. Well, it is my absolute pleasure to have on the podcast one of um, the most inspirational women I ever went to college with, hands down. Um, a truly remarkable person and tenacious person, and I value her opinion very highly. Uh, she has the same undergraduate major that I do, and she is currently stutter- studying for, I can't remember if it's her master's or her doctorate, but we'll find out. Please welcome to the show, Janae Barksdale. Hey, hey, John. I am <laughs> so glad to be here. Hey, listeners. <laughs> so, I, uh, yeah. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here, Janae. We had um, some uh, fun times uh, in college, both like fiery, um, uh, opinionated conversations after class and also sometimes in classroom. And I always appreciated your perspective. You were always on your game when it came to calling out some of the things we needed to call out back in college oh my gosh absolutely i am remembering a lot of conversation <laughs> oh man yeah, yeah definitely yeah it was it was a struggle um do you i don't i don't mean to you know tokenize you or anything but uh you were the only black woman in our particular graduate class and one of the few at the school in general. I'm sure that was quite a challenging experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I remember the very first day of one of our preaching classes. I I think it was my very first one, and it it was after I changed my interdisciplinary to uh, Bible exposition. And I walked into class, I opened the door and I never even made it past the doorway. I looked and I saw that there were only men in the class and I closed the door, turned right around and I walked the other way and I ran into our dean at the time, Wendy Liddell. And I said, Wendy, I can't do this. I, I, I cannot do this. I'm the only woman in this class. I'm, I'm not. Just the idea at that moment, the idea of race didn't even come up because it was all gender in that moment. And plus, with me being one of the, I think at that time, like maybe 
one of the 16 Black students there, I I was always highly aware of the fact that I was a Black woman, but then being a Black woman in that, in that preaching class, just, you know, just all of the, the nuances of the intersection of being Black and being a woman really came up for me in that class. But Wendy walked me right back in and said, it's going to be okay. And I mean, obviously it was because I graduated from that program. You graduated, and not only did you graduate, uh, you uh, kicked ass. You were, you were an awesome presence, and selfishly, I am very glad that you were in those classes, even if um, it was not an easy thing to do. And yeah, just, uh, I mean, we had one other woman, I believe, in our graduating class, and that was that was it. Yeah, I think, was that uh, Laura DeRuiter? I think Laura it was. DeRuiter, yep. Yes, yes, it was Laura DeRuiter. Yeah, and uh and I think it's interesting how um me being a white man like uh I didn't necessarily have those same feelings or anything when I was like, you know, walking through the door or whatever. I was like, whatever, same same thing I'm used to all the time. Everything's catered to me. But like I still would pick up on cues of um maybe how you were talked to or how your opinion was received. And maybe I was reading too much into it, but did you feel like people were maybe um, not respecting you as much as they should? I definitely felt, I can tell you what I did feel. I did know who my biggest supporters were in the class you were one of my biggest supporters. It, it's very interesting because like when I say supporter, I mean it in you and a couple other guys. You didn't come to me after class and say, hey, I really agree with what you're saying. You said it in the moment, right then, right there, made your voices heard, made it very known that you were on my side, that you heard exactly what I said, that you agreed with me and y'all were not afraid to verbally go toe to toe with someone else. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, part of it, I think it's just my, uh, like natural, like protectiveness and like, um, you know, kind of like uncomfortability when people are being talked down to regardless of, you know, race or gender. Um, but certainly optically, it did not always look good to me uh, the way those conversations went. And I'm not really trying to necessarily throw everyone in that class um, under the bus by any means. Uh, you know, where we were mostly young people trying to like figure out um, what we wanted to do in life and trying to have the right answers. But at the same time, it felt very, um, I don't know. I felt like you always had such good things to say. And like, I might've agreed with some of the things, but if it came out of my mouth, somehow it, it seemed like it was received slightly better. And that always made me pretty uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, it was one thing that especially being in seminary currently, I'm not as open with my performance arts background as I was when I was in undergrad, because I don't know if you remember, but our preaching prof, it was always at the beginning of my sermon when he would say, at the very beginning, you were acting. And then like five minutes in, that's when the real Janae would come out. And I would get so pissed off because one, I am not acting. If I am more animated, all of the, it comes from the fact that yes, I have a performance arts background. I am also the youngest. I'm also extroverted. This is not acting. And it just, it would make me so angry that it would just, it would make me shut down because I, I would be wondering, what am I doing here that my professor is dividing the acting Janae from the real Janae and that he's able to pinpoint the exact moment when I go from Jekyll to Hyde at this point? And it was, it just really pissed me off. And it, it really influenced me 
when I went to seminary that I told no one that I had a performance arts background for a very long time, for the first few years, actually, that I was in seminary. Very few people, unless I lived with you, unless I really did life with you, no one knew that I had a performance arts background because I did not want to be accused of acting in anything that I did just because my mannerisms, my pitch, my tone and inflection were a little bit more heightened or the fact that I used that my facial features are a little bit more and that, you know, and that I talk with my hands and all of these things seem to be a little bit more animated than someone else's. So it was, it was definitely so frustrating. And, I can ima- I can yeah. imagine it was it was very frustrating and I would assume that like I mean I I don't know you maybe as well as like some of your closest friends but I got to know you pretty well in those 2 years and I would say you're pretty straight up genuine uh on and off the court so to speak I I certainly never perceived that any of it was acting um I did want to ask you do you uh do you, so you are cur- you just switched one of your um the, your uh, degree for uh, master's what what is your um maybe it can be very broad but what is your vision uh i i assume you're still fairly orthodox christian and i'm curious as to um like what you want to do uh after you graduate okay well like a lot of black people in the very general protestant faith 2016 had a profound effect on me just religiously orthodoxy orthopraxy and I like many black people was a member of the black exodus in that I left not counting school but when it came to church spaces or primarily Christian spaces I pulled out of white Christian spaces for the solace of my own people to worship with them because orthodoxy, orthopraxy, just familiarity, comfortability, all of it I could find at the Black church. So am I still a believer Absolutely. I mean, you kind of, you got to be if you're going to be in seminary. But how I label myself, I just keep it super basic and say that I am a Christian, but I no longer, I, I refuse to be associated with evangelicalism in, in the sense of the word that it is touted right now, politically, socioeconomically, all that stuff. Well, then you and I, um, we might have slight, I, I've gone a little maybe less orthodox, but I will say you and I both uh, certainly have made an exodus from white evangelicalism um, and probably for somewhat similar reasons. Um, I think that it is tragic how um, certain society level issues were handled at the school you and I both went to. And I think it's tragic how they were handled across the country. Um, I definitely want to have you back on at some point to talk about um, some of this uh, this more racial stuff. Because again, if I feel like I can't speak on the sexism issues in preaching, I certainly feel like I can't speak on uh, some of the race issues in church. Um, but what I will say is that um, I think it's really cool that you're able to uh, hold fast to um, your faith and make it your own. And not just subscribe to um, whatever white evangelicals want you to think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I I think there there comes a time where we all have to wrestle with our faith and constantly ask ourselves a question, the question, is this culture? Is this biblical? Is there an overlap? Are there overlaps in a lot of it? Yeah. But for a lot of the things that we are fighting over, it's not even biblical. We we often say on my podcast, that ain't Bible. And so you just, you just have to decide for yourself, is this something that I want to be a part of 
that places culture above what the author and finisher of my faith has said. And I would prefer to be with the one who wrote it. Yeah. Well, and girl, you're already starting to get in your preaching mode and it makes me like a little nostalgic and I love hearing you preach. And I don't mean to do the same thing Rappazzini would be where it's like, you're not acting anymore. (laughs) I mean, like you've got this fire about you when you start going. And I think I have a little bit of it too, but you make me look like a fool with when you're, (laughs) when you get going, it's just so nice to hear you. Um, I don't want to call it a rant because it's more intelligent than just a, than just a rant, but I love, uh, I love when you get passionate and start talking. Um, on that note, actually, do you um, do you see yourself uh, preaching again in any context, or are you kind of done with preaching? You know, I, I, when it comes to preaching, I, I never say never. And when I'm invited, I have no issues speaking whatsoever. But as something professional, how I want it, how I want to be supported one day. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm especially being in my current program as I, I left the THM and for people that don't know, THM is Master of Theology and the program was originally created for men who were going into the pastorate. And I switched from that program to Media Arts and Worship, which is really a, a catch all for all of the creatives on campus. And merging art with my faith has been a lot more fulfilling to me than just preaching, but I can, and I do merge art with my faith when I do preach as well. But what really fills my cup is focusing on the creative. Awesome. Gotcha. Well, I do know and have witnessed you preach quite a few times and would assume that you've been uh, invited to speak um, to more than one place and stuff, and you're very good at it. Um, I have a very general question, and feel free to say I don't know or go anywhere you want with it, but why are men afraid of women pastors, do you think? Mm, That's a very interesting question, and I think And, you know, it's not just one answer that goes with it, because I've noticed and I I think you could (laughs) you would agree with this, especially coming from the undergrad that we came from, that there were that there were professors who were very supportive of women, but the donors call the shot. And yeah, and, you know, there's some in churches who absolutely want women to preach and are not afraid of women preaching. But when you've got, when you've got people in your church who are holding the purse strings and they can, they can take away their support and there's that legitimate fear and that doubt of will God provide if these people with the checkbooks go away because I've done something that they don't agree with. And, and then, you know, when we, when we take financials out of the mix, you've got people who will die on this hill about women preachers and you can, and and that pastor has to make the decision. Do I want to risk a church split or do I want my church to be whole? So you've got that. But then also you've got some that that look at that dreaded verse in it's first Timothy, correct? You know, I should know that since you know that's the one that's quoted. But you know, it's it's that verse in Timothy where it's it's not necessarily a fear, but they believe that they are interpreting scripture correctly and that women should not preach. And so, you know, for some, it is a legitimate fear, but for others, they are being, they believe that they're being obedient to scripture. So it's, it's such a multifaceted answer. Definitely. And you did good hitting on most of the facets. Um, I will say that I think uh, at least traditionally, if we want to use that word, uh, it is true that um the couple of verses in the New Testament, um, all written by Paul, I believe, 
kind of like seem to um, say women shouldn't be in this kind of leadership. But when you actually look up the verses, it's not really that clear. The clearest quote unquote verse is Paul saying, I don't permit women to speak in my church. But that's certainly not like a timeless forever principle. That seems pretty contextual to me. So I'm wondering if like maybe people are, uh, to use one of our Bible college words, eisegeting um, their own uh, different biases into uh, scripture. And there there might be some other things going on that they in which they don't want women leadership. I mean, we even know that there's some people who don't want women in politics and uh, whether they're religious or not. And I wonder if some of those same fears uh, go back into this issue. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, we're constantly forgetting that we are not the original intended audience of these magnificent letters and accounts. We are not Middle Eastern people. We are not first century Christians. And we're, especially for us who, you know, we are biblically educated through Bible college, we were constantly taught and using that analogy of a bridge that we have to bring these truths over to this context and we have to discern what's cultural and what's universal here. And that's that's something that unfortunately a lot of preachers time and time again, and not just preachers, but a lot of Christians time and time again have not put the energy into really looking at what is the cultural practice that needs to stay there and what is the overarching thing that can be brought to my culture. Yeah, I mean, historical context is definitely gravely and seriously ignored in your average church, especially in white evangelicalism. And I think that does cause a lot of problems in and of itself, in addition to people um, isolating their own things. Um, Do you think, like, I don't know, like, historically, I would say there's been sexism in preaching for literally hundreds of years. Um, Do you think there's a real movement of change happening or is there just like a, a some anon- anomalies uh, some churches are doing it to be cool or trendy or like make themselves look good or do you think there's a genuine change uh, occurring where um, there are going to be more women uh, in uh, pastoral positions I do believe that there is a genuine change happening but you know with any big cultural movement, there will always be people who are just, you know, jumping in so they can seem like they're a part of it and not to, you know, make people angry. You know, we're we're always going to have that. Is Do I believe that something is happening? Yes. Yes, I do. But also I'm in an interesting position because I'm in, I'm in a seminary where you've got professors who are who tolerate the fact that women are on this campus and that they're taking classes you've got very very recently you've got people who are in ministry who are pastors when a woman is in their preaching class will get up and leave right before she preaches so it's you you you've got this it, there's this tension where those in the world who are who are not in school right now are a part of the movement, but then you have those who are being trained up in seminary that are in the Christian realm academically and in their lives who are of the opinion that women shouldn't even be on this campus even if it's just to get a basic degree. So it's, uh, it's, it's just a, it's a very interesting thing. Yeah. It's a very, um, it's a very sad thing to me as far as the perspective of um, 
anytime you're telling someone they should not do something they want to do based solely on either their gender, race, sexual orientation, anything like that, um, it's pretty upsetting to me personally, just because regardless of whether I think preaching is even an important thing, it's kind of besides the point. To me, it's like if someone wants to do something, let alone feels called to it within your belief system, kind of how dare you um, put any barriers between them doing that or even allow people who want to put barriers there um, to participate in what you're doing. And and uh, I think it's very sad. And, and frankly, like, you know, someone like you who, you know, we might not see eye to eye on every, you know, theological point. One thing we will see eye to eye on is if you preach well and you want to preach, you ought to be able to have the opportunity to do so. And while you did for a short period of time, it still felt like there were a lot of barriers in your way. Um, like you were saying, like even walking into the classroom to learn some basics of preaching, you don't get to see anyone um, who looks like you based on your uh, race or gender. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I will say that, and I think you remember that our professor, he did a good job of, especially with the videos that we had to watch, for examples of pulling in people of different races. He brought in different women to talk as well. So he he did do a good job of that. But you you know, in general, when you're when you're in this class with just I know three men. For me, it was three men who I knew were for me and I knew were behind me out of and it was a pretty small class, but three men, you know. <laughs> so it was a uh, hell gosh. You know, the only word that I can say is interesting because yeah. I, I I was coming from a different background. I was coming from a different perspective that at that point, no one else came from. So there was a lot of contextualization and cultural differences and all of that, that just in the school in general, that was hard. I bet. Yeah, I honestly can't imagine dealing with what you had to deal with um i did want to ask um uh not if but what are some of the benefits um to more women pastors in churches well one you get a different perspective also the way that we read scripture is automatically going to be different and it also reminds me of, because, you know, especially with the things that have been going on with the Black Lives Matter movement and Hands Up, Don't Shoot, and how people are trying to diversify. And why is that? Why are people trying to diversify and bring on more Black, Indigenous, people of color, Black and brown people? Because all of these perspectives are different. And we are going to pick up on things that you as, you know, a white male will not pick up on. And it is the same thing with women. Me, when I read about Mary, me as a woman, thinking about her as possibly a 13 to 15 year old young woman who has literally just gotten her period and been told that she is going to birth the savior of the universe. The way I read that and the way you read that is going to be two completely different things. And especially, you know, when me as a woman, when I read the story of David and Bathsheba, and how they put in there. And, you know, especially if you read commentaries and if you know the original language, I do not, but I have friends that do. But when she, when it says that she was, you know, doing her washing, we know as a woman, I know that she has just gotten off of her period. And so that is a significant thing in the story that a man in general will not pick up on. Absolutely. And I think those insights, um, while maybe a man might pick up on them after a while or by reading a commentary or whatever, it's not, if you have a woman um, preacher uh, who is uh, dedicating her time to studying and teaching the Bible, you'll definitely um, 
have a different voice being said. And I think in some ways a necessary voice in our culture, because right now everything is so catered to uh, the male and specifically the white male, but uh, a male perspective. Um, And I think that that's really damaging on different levels, um, both to women and to men. Like, I think it's really bad for men to be coddled and to be like um, told that everything that you are feeling and you are uh, your perspective on life is valid and all these other perspectives are uh, less valid, I think is is a bad thing. And I think per- perhaps women leadership in general um, could help alleviate that o- automatically. And especially when talking about um, deep things like religion and God and, and so forth. Um, do you think, um, I, I know I haven't aired all my problems with you uh, <laughs> that I have with Christianity now, Um But do you think, uh, you know, some of my problems with Christianity in general, uh, it's what most people have problems with. It's it's some of the bigotry. It's some of the um, hypocrisy. It's some of the lack of accountability, all these different things. Do you think um, some of my problems with Christianity could be solved if there was more female leadership? Not just more female leadership, but more people of color at the table. And not just because it's it's very, because for me, when I say more people of color at the table, I have to be very specific because you can have people of color and women at the table who have the exact same views as you. One thing that pisses me off is that, you know, you'll have that, that white person who will disagree with you up and down and then bring up somebody like Candace Owens who agrees with them. And you'll notice that it is literally one black person who espouses your view. And you use that one voice to trump the masses. So when it comes to inviting people to the table, it has to be people, yes, who do share the same views as you, but people who don't share the same views as you as well. But you it is paramount that y'all must have the same foundation of believing in Christ as your Lord and Savior, that he, that you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If that is where you can have your starting point, then you can go up from there and then you can work from there to determine, okay, are these the right people at my table? But then it's not just that, but it's what are you trying to accomplish with these people at your table? Because you can have a bunch of people with the seat, but y'all are not going to get anything done. What is your plan? What is your end goal? How do you want to love people? And what steps are you going to take to do that? Yeah, figuring out um, how to love people can't be done by one perspective um whether it be a particular race or a particular gender or a particular sexual orientation um and i do think that you are right that it is fine for people with a common vision of the jesus narrative um to come together and to figure out um what what action plan they want to do based on that belief i wonder sometimes if um even the idea of like do you all believe uh in the death burial resurrection of christ like death burial and resurrection of christ still means different things to different people and i think sometimes we're still operating off a very white evangelical even male perspective when it comes to understanding what that even means yeah yeah definitely and so we we have to define the terms, you know, we, we have to define what do we believe when I say this? Cause you know, we, we can get a, we can get caught up in our Christianese and your Christianese isn't necessarily you as a white male. I'm able to speak your language. I'm able to speak white Christianese, but I don't know that you can necessarily speak black Christianese. And there, I, I'm there sure I would get in trouble. 
I'm sure I would get in trouble <laughs> if I tried. <laughs> you know, luckily we are very gracious people. So, but uh, yeah, but you know, it's it's not like you know when you come in to different cultures, there's there's a a different language that is spoken. But when it comes to very basic theological terms, there's there has to be an agreement there. There has to be an agreement because if your foundation is not right, I'm not for it. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's totally reasonable. And I think the foundation of the white evangelical perspective that you and I have both left um has not uh done a it has not been a good foundation and has been um really derivative of orthodox christianity but not orthodox christianity um and i think it's very inspiring that you're able to again hold on to your faith that i don't think i am uh quite as faithful as you uh are still and i i admire you for it i think it's um a good thing and not a bad thing but I do think um, white evangelicalism in the United States is a pretty bad thing. Um, and part of it is because there's this um, sexism in preaching. I mean, that's just one example of, of the many problems that I talk about on the, this podcast. Listen, I know that I messed up and wanted to talk to you for longer, but you actually need to go here pretty soon. But you... I'm actually able to go like 10 more minutes if you want to. Well, in that case, let's get 10 more minutes out of you because I love to hear your perspectives. Um, can you go more into what your uh, lived experience with sexism and preaching is? I know you've referenced some things, but maybe outside of the classroom, like I know you had some opportunities outside of class to preach. Did you feel like you dealt with much sexism there at all? Yeah, actually, one one thing that comes to the very forefront of my mind, I had uh, I had uh, just finished preaching at my mother's church for Women's Day, my parents' church, and I, I was very conscious of the pronouns that I used. They were very gender inclusive. My my examples, my imagery, all that is very gender inclusive. And right after I finished preaching, the one of the associate pastors was on the front row. And he said, now, I like what you said, but couldn't you have added anything in there for the men? And I said, well, actually, I did when I said us, we and our. And I I laughed on the inside that because it just it cracked me up that the one day of the year when a church service is not about you, you still wanted it to be about you on Women's Day of all days. I mean, isn't that just such a testament to like the conditioning of being used to male preachers, being used to studying um, theological figures who are male, being <laughs> used to uh, everything surrounding your gender. And when in this religious context, they just they just literally have a day that, you know, just to say, oh, yeah, don't forget, like women are people, too. And then this this guy's like, now, wait a second. What what exactly are you saying here? And and I don't want to just make fun of that person. I think that's like almost like I mean, like a knee jerk reaction based on the conditioning he's received because no one's bothered to uh, uh, do anything but cater to that perspective. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm absolutely. And, you know, I've, uh, when I preach, you will never hear sports reference from me because I don't like sports. I'm I'm not going to do it. And you know, and I one thing that I said in our in our preaching classes because I do acknowledge that there are women who love sports. There are women who play sports. I played sports in high school. I love volleyball. I love it. I love it. I love it. But I used to tell y'all when you would make a sports reference that I would be completely lost because I have no idea what you're talking about. In fact, my first semester, my very first day of Greek one, it was the first half of class and my professor asked if we had any questions. And I said, yes, do you use any other references besides sports? And he said, yeah, well, I actually didn't use sports a lot. And I said, actually, you did. 
and it throws me off completely. Do you have any other references? He said, yeah, you know, I, I guess I, I could talk about gardening. I said, that's great. I know a lot about gardening, please. And um, so for the man who said, I actually don't use a lot of sports references after we finished break and he started talking and, and he was he was using a simile and he said, you know, it's like, and then he stopped and I was looking down at my laptop and the whole class went silent. I looked up and everyone was looking at me because the professor looked at me and he stopped himself because he was about to use a sports reference. And he said, it's like doing the dishes. Oh and no. <laughs> I think, and you know, for him, I think that's when it hit him. Oh my gosh. I do use a lot of sports references, even though mere minutes ago, I just said that I didn't. So that was very eye opening for him. Let me think of other times. Well, that. that's that's. I just want to pause and say that's so terrible that the only thing he could think of when he looked at the woman in the class was doing dishes. You know, I I will give that man a lot of credit because from that point forward, he was very aware of how often he used sports references that he really tried to diversify his examples and he very rarely used sports so he was one of those professors that was like okay you've made me aware of something <laughs> so let me let me go ahead and bust the Yui and try to figure this out yeah and we we had a lot of good professors who like were definitely uh, more accommodating to students than uh some schools are <laughs> I will say though like it, it, it's something like I know this is kind of we're harping on this example a lot but it is true that pastors uh, modern day do use a lot of sports analogies and not only does it leave out women but it leaves out men who don't like sports and I think it's kind of implicitly sexist to be like I'll use sports analogies for men and chores for women like that's that's a uh, that's problematic from the get-go, even if the person saying it is not um, like overtly sexist. It still shows that there's a problem. Yeah, definitely. Or when you, it's, it's little things. When you hear of someone being faithful and strong is usually in relation to a male Bible. And I don't even like to say character, a Bible person, historical figure, or when someone was wrong or they were mean or they were unfaithful, it's usually, they're usually talking about a woman. And even, even wisdom is talked about as a woman. I mean, come on, wisdom, she cries out from the streets. Come on. So, so pastors really have to work at a woman is strong too. A man can be unfaithful and is unwise and trying to make sure that they are very aware of the examples who these words that they use and the gender that they assign to these words. What does it communicate to me as a woman when someone is wrong, they're unfaithful, they're stiff necked and all of these other um Bible words is only about a woman or and if we're if you are telling a story and you say this person really showed up and he did this and he did that well what about that woman did she show up did she do this did she do that or even in the names with people that we use in our examples why does it have to be a Sarah you know, can it be a Lupe? Can it be an Enrique? You know, we're constantly using these names that are that are really white when you've got black and brown people who are sitting in your congregations that are hearing that, okay, well, all of the bad examples, they're women. And then when you are talking about real people, I don't even see myself in the story because I don't hear someone whose name is like mine. I think you're definitely right that in white evangelicalism, there is no effort made to preach something that isn't already white evangelical and frankly male. 
Um, while some white, while I still think like a white female might um, get more out of white evangelicalism's uh, benefits than uh, a black female, I do think uh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I do think I do. Yeah, I mean, obvious statement of the day, but I, but I do think um, that you're right that like for those communities, it's actually very damaging and it's built in. And I think part of the reason is, um, you know, white evangelicalism is a structure that. Uh, needs control and order and like wants um whether it's subtle or overt they want to make clear that the way of doing things uh is is, belongs to them and it is not up for debate and it is not um anything further and i just want to say janae like i am uh very glad and comforted that there are people like you who are still um staying faithful and wanting to do good work um, in spite of what you have experienced, it's it's very encouraging. Thanks, John. I, I appreciate it. And you know, I would be remiss if I didn't say that. You know, there there's a lot of tension and there's a lot of struggle, and that you know, there I do struggle with doubt, and I do. There's so many times that I want to like just chuck the deuces, throw up my middle fingers and say, I'm done. Y'all are pissing me off. I'm out. But I, I have to remind myself that the author and finisher of my faith, praise the Lord when I do stuff that he doesn't throw up his two fingers and say, bye. You, you're doing too much, Janae. And so I I have to go with his example. But then also I do recognize with you, John, that there are times when you need a Sabbath and you just, you got to withdraw from church people because we are work. Church people are work. We are tiring. We are annoying. We're all of it. And it's heightened by the fact that we have the truth, we have the word, and we're still acting like we are some non-believers, you know? And even then, I'm giving non-believers a bad rap because, you know, there have been many instances where I felt more welcome in the company of non-believers than I have with believers. I mean, come on, you mean to tell me that Gentiles, people in the dark, are being more Christ-like? Then people who know the Lord, come on. And so there there are times where, like you, that I have had to withdraw, that I have had to take a Sabbath for my own mental and emotional health. But then, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm about to make a sports reference after I said I never make sports references. But, you know, there are times when the coach says, get off the bench and go back into the game. And you have to be obedient to that. And so right now, John, for you, for your own safety, you're on the bench. But I have no doubt that when you're called to go back into the game, you will. And I would venture to say that your podcast is a foray back into that game. Well, I would just want to say, firstly, I am glad that you brought up the point that, uh, yeah, non-believers sometimes seem to be uh, more Christ-like than those who supposedly follow Christ. Because I was going to bring that up as one of the initial reasons I left church um, was I not only felt that I was around better people, I found myself to be a better person when I stopped going to church. And then uh, to comment on the whole if I'm on the bench or not, I've I've often joked uh, that if I ever did... Um, identify as a Christian again, it would be a hell of a testimony um, because I have done done myself uh, in quite a bit with uh, writing a book calling Christianity a cult and doing the rest of it. Um, but I but I am not closed off. I am not one who says I know all truth at all times and I will never change. Uh, that's not healthy and I refuse to be a person like that. So I won't say you're wrong. I'll say I will be surprised if you're right, but that does not mean that I uh, I think you're wrong by any means. And regardless of whether I end up staying on the bench or not, uh, I absolutely want to stay connected with people like you who, regardless of faith differences, I still view you as a very loving, caring, and awesome person. And I'm very inspired by um, not not what you believe, but by how you act and what you do. And I'm very thankful I've met you. Yeah, same for me. You know, if if we didn't have 
a foundation that was built, you know, all the way back in, gosh, what, 2015, when we first really started having classes together, like 2014, 2015, I would not be on this podcast right now. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be on this podcast right now if it weren't for the foundation that we built together, being in the trenches together in a very white evangelical space. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm glad you were there, and I'm I'm glad for any amount um, of uh, of safety I could I could give to you. I I, I am still very sad about uh, how certain things went down at that school, and I'm very proud of you for um, being strong through all of it and uh, continuing to be strong. Uh, it is time for me to let you go, but you have your own podcast. That is awesome. I've listened to a couple of episodes. Would you want to plug it here? Yeah, I would. I would be a horrible podcaster if I did not. Yes. Yeah, so I have a podcast with my best friend. Her name is Christian Williams. Our podcast is called Bad Seminarians. We are about to wrap up our for, our first season. I think our last episode airs April 14th. So you can find us on all streaming platforms. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all of that stuff. And of course, John, I'll send you the information so you can post and everything. Well, I absolutely will. Um, it is it is fun because I get to hear my friend Janae talk and laugh and uh, have a good time. And also y'all talk about um, very uh, important things to talk about from an authoritative voice um, and are able to uh, get uh, people uh, <laughs> get their get their heads right on things that um, their heads are not right. And I love the title, by the way, Bad Seminarians. I mean, it's it's pretty great. So Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, man, I wish we had even more time because I could just talk to you forever. But uh, again, thank you so much, Janae. And uh, I hope to have you back on fairly soon. For all practical purposes, preaching in evangelicalism serves white men best, people of color men next, white women after, and people of color women least. Even further down the totem pole, we would find our LGBTQIA plus friends' needs are not even considered. Perhaps it doesn't have to be that way. Preaching does seem to encapsulate the essentials of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Preaching is free speech and freedom of religion, all wrapped in one single exercise. Is this the fundamental building block of all freedom U.S. citizens experience? I'll leave the deconstruction of how much freedom U.S. citizens actually experience to someone else. What I will say is that this exercise of preaching should never be outlawed, but I don't think it should be revered. I wouldn't call it holy, essential, biblical, or even always well-meaning. Keep in mind, my whole life's purpose for a significant portion of my life was to preach. I felt called. I spent an uncountable number of hours studying the Bible, studying the art of preaching, and planning my entire life around the assumption that I would be a pastor. My critiques are not merely bitter, and certainly are not unfounded. I have spent time with many different pastors, with various personalities, methodologies, and orthopraxies. Grim realities present themselves to me against my will. I did not seek them out. Reality is that pastors do not work hard, generally speaking. 
While they are doing work that is emotionally draining, I do not think it is fair to say they are the hardest working people I have ever met. Most do not even fulfill their own minimum requirements. I flimpli- uh, fl- rather flippantly made this point several times as a guest on other podcasts. I always anticipate a lot of negative feedback from this claim. It is deeply ingrained in evangelical cultures that pastors do the most difficult work of anyone they will ever meet. Firstly, I will acknowledge that much of this perspective is certainly subjective and hard to objectively quantify. I have had various jobs where, self-admittedly, I did not work awfully hard and was overpaid, as well as the inverse being true of other work I've done. Jobs are weird like that, and different people will go about their jobs differently. This applies to the vocation of pastor as well. However, I must immediately follow that acknowledgement with the postulation that paying a pastor, specifically paying them to preach, is ridiculous in a spiritual sense. In a purely capitalist sense, people can give money to whoever they want in exchange for whatever service they want. If it happens to be preaching, so be it. But in an era of podcasts, audiobooks, and YouTube, paying someone to talk about topics seems like a ripoff. Further, paying someone an indefinite amount based on the compulsions of an offering plate or support letters in the case of a church plant seems sinister to me. What exactly do you pay a pastor to do? Is it to be a guru? Is it to be a crisis responder or on retainer? Is it to be an intermediary between you and the divine? Is it to be a community organizer politically? Is it to be a sermon apparatus that spits out lectures once a week like some sort of theological vending machine? None of these things seem to be a decreed position by Jesus or the apostles. There were certainly leaders in ancient churches, typically older folk who were charged with caring for the needs of their communities, but both culturally and practically, they were in no way comparable to the white evangelical pastor who lives down the road from you. At the end of the day, isn't preaching just talking? Is it really inspired, or just TED Talks that can sometimes be wrong-headed and inaccurate? Regardless, evangelicals brazenly invoke divine authority for their own personal opinion. Folks give the pastor more divine weight, but I think it might be a larger projection that they think a pastor's ideas are automatically gospel truth due to the listener's religious allegiance. I find it rather ironic that the 15th century reformers were so incredibly critical of papal infallibility, but their evangelical predecessors essentially believe their pastor has the exact same kind of supernatural authority when they preach. It is an astounding leap of logic to assume that preaching is divinely inspired, even if you believe scripture to be divinely inspired. Many evangelicals will not come out and say that they believe their pastors are infallible when they preach, but all of their rhetoric implies it. Even the most contemporary, blue-jean-wearing, rock-and-roll-playing evangelicals might use a simple phrase like, respect for my pastor, to mean allegiance to his words. As more and more younger people renounce or disinterest themselves from church membership, most evangelical pastors cling harder to their tradition of preaching. They believe that there can be a third great awakening of biblical preaching if they recapture the verdict that the preacher's task is enabled by divine authority. Well, an argument from authority, also called an appeal to authority, is a form of argument in which the opinion of an authority on the topic is used as evidence to support an argument. In a proper sense, an argument from authority can be a simple reference to expertise or study and not inherently fallacious. However, it can be considered to most often be a logical fallacy to cite an authority on the discussed topic as the primary means of supporting an argument. Preaching uses scripture as its primary source of authority, and yet sermons are not mere reading of text. Preaching is commentary of text 
All sane people know that individuals are flawed and do not always espouse accurate words, myself included. So to give preaching holy weight is unfounded biblically and unwise with any proper understanding of humanity. The divine authority of preaching is taught explicitly and implicitly through evangelicalism in the United States. The apparent danger does not need to be spelled out. This kind of authoritative approach is the most commonly understood use of a cult leader. They employ this tactic. But why is this tactic employed? Is it just a bad habit or unfortunate tradition? I don't think so. Whether it is subtextual or overt, this appeal to authority has a pragmatic function within the white evangelical cult. I personally think that um, sermons are used to gatekeep ideas. I think it mimics political stump speeches and is a covert and overt way that pastors indoctrinate their congregants. Even if preaching could be used in good ways, the temptation to use the power that comes with preaching evilly is undoubtable as far as I can tell. Read any book or article about the art of manipulation and compare the indicators of exploitation with any sermon you can get your hands on. There will be parallels. Part of this is the fact that preaching is by nature meant to be persuasive. I'm sure you could run a similar exercise to the uh, the one I just mentioned on any political speech, or maybe if you did that, you'd find um, even more disheartening results than you would doing this with sermons. Politics is pretty disgusting, after all. But persuasion is not inherently evil, and will sometimes Venn diagram with our understanding of manipulation. However, I'm not familiar with any political leaders at least non-dictators, who demand and recommend attendance to lectures once a week for your entire lifetime. This is what is expected in evangelicalism. And a sermon can be many things, from performance art pieces to dry academic lectures. No matter what flavor of speech a Christian might enjoy, they are tools for cult leaders, far removed from the tone and method of the Sermon on the Mount. If Christian leaders postulate that only those they have appointed to speak on Scripture will accurately depict the intended meaning of Scripture, they preserve their power regardless of any objective qualification or education. Whether a pastor is a good speaker or not, or even brings up good points or not, is not a metric in evangelicalism. So whatever good sermons have been preached throughout history... Even those done by my friends and ones I have preached. They are not so valuable that sacrificing honesty about the spiritual reality of a speech. Sermons are not holy. Even if preaching has been profitable for society on any level, the power that it affords white white evangelical cult leaders is a net loss. Persuasive talking is not bad, but the subtle way that pastors maintain control over their congregants through this practice is nauseating. Sermons are used by the cult of Christianity to keep your mind in line with theirs. Do not allow these cult leaders to control you by decreeing their opinions as some sort of divine law. In fact, Contrast their sermons with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And remember that when Jesus had finished saying those things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had permission and not as their religious leaders. If you wish to learn more about what's going on in my life or wish to purchase my book, go to vernerbooks.com. If you'd like to support this podcast, please continue to listen, follow, share, and consider supporting through the link in the show's notes. For as little as 99 cents a month, you can help me book guests, upgrade my production value, and start exciting projects. Thank you for listening, and remember to keep love in your life, hope in your heart, and searching in your soul.